So I'll go ahead and do your introduction and then we can get rolling, okay? Okay. All right, you, you can uh, start your title slide if you want to. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see y'all. Um, I'm Cody Arnall, Assistant Professor of Sculpture. It's my pleasure to introduce Rick McCoy. Uh, Rick will be delivering this lecture as part of the final year requirements of the School of Arts MFA program. After the lecture, you will be able to ask Rick questions about his research and work. You can do so by unmuting your microphone or by typing your comments in the questions or questions in the chat. Uh, for the time being, will you please make sure that your microphones are muted? All right, so Rick is from Burlington, Kansas. He received a BFA with a concentration in sculpture from the University of North Texas in Denton. At Texas Tech University, Rick has been the recipient of numerous scholarships, including the Ken Little Medici Circle Studio Art Scholarship, the Paul and T. Delia Roque Scholarship, three university student housing scholarships, an art Memorial Endowment Scholarship, a Helen Jones Foundation Scholarship, the Richard and Sybil Dickey Art Scholarship, and a College of Visual and Performing Arts Scholarship. Rick has been a TA in numerous school of art classes, including metal fabrication, mixed media, installation and technology, and 3D design. He has also served as a woodshop assistant. In the summer of 2019, he participated in the Marfa Intensive, Marfa Intensive in Marfa, Texas. Recent exhibitions include Metal Complexions, um, Houston Metal Arts Guild National Juried Exhibition at Young Center in Houston, Texas. Breaking Ground 2, a group exhibition at the School of Art Landmark Gallery. 2019 Breaking Ground, group exhibition at the Crowley Theater in Marfa, Texas, and the School of Art Exhibition group exhibition at Urban Tech in downtown Lubbock. Rick's work is featured in over 10 private collections, including those in New York, Virginia, Illinois, Indiana, Texas, and Kansas. And he was also recently featured in Sculpture Magazine's 2020 International Sculpture Day issue in July and August of 2020. I'm proud to hand things over to Rick. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cody, for that. Um, I want to take a little bit of time to thank a few people. Uh, I think it's important to do. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to my committee, uh, Cody Arnall, William Cannings, uh, Horgelina Orfila, and Rob Glover. Uh, thank you for putting up with me and uh, for helping me get ready for this. I appreciate all of your, your insight and your help. Um, second, I, I definitely wanna say thank you to the rest of the professors here at Tech. Um, it's been an amazing experience for me. I've learned so much and you guys seriously have taught me more than you know. So thank you for everything. Um, and then I definitely have to say uh, thank you so much to my family uh, for always believing in me and my decisions. So thank you. Um, and then last, of course, I got to say thank you to all my fellow grads and uh, the love and support you've shown me in this roller coaster of a ride we're on together. Uh, we're almost there, guys. We're almost there. All right. So today I'm going to be kind of talking about my work. Uh, that I've done while here, some of the things I've been thinking about, and uh, the research that I have done. So uh, we'll just get straight into it. So my aim is to explore and to transform how American culture thinks, makes, and values materials. And I feel like my titles of my pieces uh, reflect those aims. So uh, a few of those titles are uh, Phenotypic Plasticity, uh, Dissemination of Detritus, transmission of ignorance and densified absurdity, to just name a few. I, I feel like the language is very important in my works because it helps to uh, have the uh, viewer create a stronger tie to my work and to get a better understanding of what it's about. Um, as I see, many of you know uh, where I'm from and, and uh, thank you for coming. But for those of you who don't know, I, I am from Kansas. And I lived in a small town and I grew up in a house that was in the country about seven miles from town. Now, because of that, I was cut off from the influences of society uh, like the other kids and their activities. Well, that is except for sports and school, of course. And through that, I feel like it's been one of my best life's experiences because 
uh, it allowed me to spend so much time outdoors. And hey, Rick, that, you're, I just want to, sorry, you're not screen sharing if you're meaning to? It's not? No. What the heck? I can, oh. It's, it's not. Yeah, we don't see his PowerPoint. Uh, it says video sharing. Um, all right, how do I get out of this? Go down to the bottom in the middle where it says screen share. Yeah. Yeah, hit that. There you go. Okay. Awesome. There, that's better. Okay. So, where was I? Uh, so, because of being able to spend so much time outdoors, it has allowed me to have a very strong connection to uh, my environment, or as the West calls, uh, nature, okay? And I feel like this has been a very strong source of my inspiration for not only my life, but in my art as well, because I didn't realize how strong I've been affected by and respond to my environment. Uh-oh, come on. Why is it? Okay, now it's not wanting to, all right, there we go. So uh, upon completion of my first semester here, I decided to travel back home and you know, get some distance away from school and calm down and kind of reflect on the different things that I had learned, the different, um, what do you wanna say, like concepts that I had, had been taught. And one of the things you may not know about Texas and especially West Texas, it's the, one of the windiest places I've ever been. People think Kansas is windy, you have no idea. Uh, and the other thing was, I've never seen a tumbleweed, which is what you're seeing here in, in, in real life. I've only seen it in, in video or on TV. And in this drive home, it was about nine hour drive and almost the entire way, it was so windy that I had to like white knuckle it the whole time. So I didn't get a chance to actually um, record it. So this is kind of what it would have looked like if I had been able to record it. A tumbleweed is a uh, invasive species of sage that originated in Russia. And what happens is when they die, they break off at their root systems. And then uh, with windy conditions, like you saw just a minute ago, uh, it allows them to roll or even float through the air. And in order to you know, be what it is, it has to let itself go to the mercy of the wind. So what is a tumbleweed without wind, right? It shapes itself in response to the wind and becomes one with it. And I feel like humans have resisted this. They actually look for and find ways to use the wind instead of being one with it. So in the video on the left, you can kind of see how easily the, the tumbleweed is picked up and is floating through the air. And it is because of this is why it is so invasive because it allows it to spread its seeds over massive distances. On the video on the right, you can see uh, how easily a tr like trash bag or a shopping bag can do the very same thing. They can float through the air with ease and travel massive distances. So before I made it home on that trip, I started to think about these things and realized how strong of a connection I have to my environment and wanted to ask myself like, what, what kind of issues are we facing that are affecting our ecosystems? And at that very moment, a shopping bag like this float, was floating through the air across the road. It almost stuck to my antenna of my truck. And it clicked right then out of this serendipitous moment, I realized that's what I should be making about, the wicked problem of plastic pollution. And at the same time, I was also thinking, okay, well, this is a material because I'm very much into materiality. I've never used this material, so what can I do with it? And that's where it kind of headed from there. So with these two things in mind, I created a phenotypic plasticity where I used the tumbleweed and shopping bags as materials. Uh, I wanted the shopping bags to kind of denote how we are dominating our ecosystems and destructing them. And also, with the shopping bags, I melted them over each branch individually, kind of slowly growing it. And I, I see this as similar to the continual growth of the Plastic Trash Collective. 
So eventually I had to ask myself, well, what exactly is nature? And through my research, I found that it is actually just a human construct, which differs between cultures, depending on how they relate to their own environments. So we are actually shaped by our culture. And from this knowledge, we act in such a way that it is understandable to those around us. And humans have created um, these binaries in order to, you know, understand the world around them. And in the West, we use it to dominate that world around us. So according to uh, French philosopher Giles Deleuze, all things in the universe are interconnected, making it similar to a plant rhizome system. However, this idea in itself is a construct. He uses this as a way to describe or um, like his view of the world. So it's, it's his own construct. We're all living in energies and intensities. We're all at one with the rest of the world. We're always in flux and constantly responding to our environment, which this is a constant feedback loop, just like a rhizome system. So with that said, we're not a part of, we're just a part of it. We're also, uh, we are a part of it, not just observers. Sorry about that. However, I feel like humans tend to fixate on ideas, concepts, and things that we see as mere objects. We impose these notions onto the world um, until they become our reality, right? We use them as tools to dominate the known world that we have actually created and imposed on the outside. And because of this, we see ourselves as superior to that which we control. Many cultures now see or view nature as other or as a separate entity, instead of something that we're embedded in and are part of, and it's part of our daily lives. Many now view nature as, uh, view nature as something that we possess or that we use, rather than something that we live in and are a part of. So with that said, with the decisions that we make every day to continue to be a throwaway culture, we are affecting everything and everyone on this planet. Usurpation is a uh, installation piece of art that is made out of 40 tumbleweeds that is covered in a uh, white latex paint, which white latex paint is a form of plastic. And in this piece, it actually consumes all of the tumbleweeds. Here you can see there was a framework that was made to hold lights. And when the lights are turned on, they actually envelop the entire uh, thing of tumbleweeds and beyond, which lights up the entire room and casts a shadow on the back wall. There is a space that is uh, left open between the tumbleweeds and the framework, which allows the viewer to actually walk around it and become a part of the installation. And here you can see my uh, shadow on the back wall. So when a, a person actually walks through and becomes a part of this piece, their shadow gets projected onto the back wall, allowing them to see how they have become a part of the installation. The colors actually change with the, the lights and this changes the mood or the feeling of the installation as well as uh, kind of represents the different climates on the earth from the ocean to the desert uh, to the uh, polar ice caps, which is everywhere that plastics are now found. Now, while researching this uh, plastic as material, I started to notice some statistics that really were appalling about how bad the plastic pollution actually is and how we as a society continue to uh, contribute to this problem. According to Sky News, 78 million tons of single-use plastic packaging is produced per year. Of that, sadly, only 14% is collected. It's not very much. And even worse, only 2% of that is recycled at a high enough quality to be reused. That's really not very much. 14% of that gets burned. 
40% of it gets dumped directly straight into our landfills and the last 30% doesn't get collected at all. And this is getting into our waterways, our oceans and our backyards. That 30% represents 23 million tons per year. And that grows exponentially every year. And they're actually talking about ramping up production within the next few years. In this slide, you can see the top three contributors to the plastic uh, packaging problem, Coca-Cola being number one. So if you remember at the end of this, ask me an interesting fact about this slide. So while I was here, going through these investigations of plastics, I visited the uh, recycling center here at Texas Tech uh, University. And I was introduced to a bunch of processes of recycling that I had never heard of and I've definitely never seen. And one of those is the styrofoam densifier. And this is a result of what that looks like. If you didn't know, styrofoam is a form of plastic uh, called expanded polystyrene foam or EPS for short. So in the last couple of slides, you can see the end result of what comes out of the machine. And what it does is it uses heat to melt down the plastic, uh, relieving all the air out of it at a 90 to one ratio because uh, styrofoam is produced with about 97 to 99% air. And this is what it leaves, a very dense, hard, crazy looking material. I collected some of this uh, from the recycling center and it sat in front of my studio for a little while. I knew there was something special about it, but I hadn't quite figured out, you know, put my thumb on that pulse of that, what to do with it. A few months later, the university contacted me and told me they were looking at selling the machine. And I jumped at this immediately. I knew that I had to have this machine so I can continue researching this material and being able to produce this material on a larger scale. I believe we can uh, fix a lot of the problems that we've created and the damage we've created through technology. However, I feel we have to change our wasteful habits first. So here's a video of the machine running. Pretty wild, right? So after that, the university decided they wanted to continue processing the um, different types of plastic and, and uh, styrofoam that we get collected both from campus and all over uh, Lubbock. This machine that they bought uses only pressure. It doesn't use heat and it uses it to compress the material together, pressing out all of the air manually. This leaves a, a new material, this long extruded kind of material. And it looks like bricks when it's broken down into smaller pieces. So I was allowed to take some of that material as well. And with that, I created frame complacency. Uh, in this is a used frame that is then refinished with a dark stain and a gold painted accents. And then the uh, styrofoam bricks are then placed inside of it. Essentially what this is doing is framing the material uh, that is usually looked at as trash. So it's giving it a new importance, okay? Especially when it's displayed in a gallery or museum, it's placing a higher importance on the material that's being highlighted. So after it's been condensed, as you can see here, it's a little bit harder to understand what it is or to see what this material is. And I really wanted ambiguity to be um, important in this piece. Once a viewer is pulled in a little bit closer and takes a little bit of time to study what this is, they start to notice um, small traces or small hints of advertising, which is left from the cups that have been smashed. And as you can see here, there's a little bit of McDonald's there, some Coca-Cola, maybe even some Chick-fil-A. On the back side of this piece is a poster that has all the different um, fast food and grocery stores that still use plastic cups and plastic packaging uh, that we consume on a daily basis. The frame is hung just off the wall in order to be able to see the uh, mirror that's placed behind it, which allows you to see the poster. If you don't take the time to actually uh, to look a little deeper, you don't get that gift. 
So what I equate this to is similar to the painting The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. And what he did was he used anamorphic, anamorphic perspective. And you can see it down on the left. It's a skull that you can't really tell what it is looking at it straight on. It's only until you change your perspective or your angle that you can see the skull as it's intended. And I feel the same as for this piece, because it's not until you change your perspective that you can see what the material is made out of and it and being highlighted by the, the mirror. And I feel like this is what we should all be doing with plastic packaging or plastics period is we need to change our perspective. So one of the things that really stuck out to me within my research is that I feel we're talking about like plastic pollution all wrong. We're not like, how do you want to say this? We're not hurting the planet itself. We're hurting the environment that we rely on to survive. This planet's been here for what, four and a half billion years? It's a long time. And it's seen many different extinctions in that time. Yet the planet remains. Humans, on the other hand, have only been on this planet, what, maybe 200,000 years? And we've been in industry, what, maybe 200 years? And we think what we're doing and have done is actually going to affect or hurt the planet itself? No. Historically, this planet has been through way worse than anything we could ever throw at it, okay? It's been through meteors, asteroids, plate tectonics, solar flares, cosmic rays, et cetera, et cetera. No, what we're actually doing is we're destroying the environment or the ecosystems that we rely on to live. This giant bluish green rock has been through many things like this before and it's healed itself before. It's, it's a self-correcting system. So it will cleanse itself again. Therefore, even if plastics are not degradable, the planet will just create a new paradigm, incorporating the plastics, earth plus plastics. Even if this kills off all living things at the, in the process of doing that, including us. And there's an article by uh, Carla Russo in the Huffington Post that talks about this very thing. Scientists have discovered a new type of rock on the beaches of Hawaii. They, as you can see in the last few slides, uh, they consist of sedimentary rock, natural debris, and melted plastics that are holding it together that have been pulled in from the oceans. And they are now calling this plastic glomerates. This is showing how the earth is unbiasedly consuming our oil-based products back into itself. It's creating a new paradigm. It is writing itself. Uh, excuse me. Amalgamated communication mimics this paradigm shift, but it, while at the same time using locally found materials. It is made of concrete, a wooden wire frame, and an assortment of different wires that are covered in plastic, as well as plastic um, connectors where the wires used to be connected from a local phone company. Now you might think that landlines are now obsolete with the use of cell phones, right? Well, turns out a lot of businesses still use them today. So what this does is now there's even more trash being generated by newer and better cell phones coming out constantly. And in using these materials from a commercial company, it's showing how this problem is much deeper and much worse than most think and most never see. This is showing how not only objects that we throw away from home, but also from businesses could be just as bad or worse. And I found that in construction, it is responsible for about 25% by volume of all trash in our landfills. That's a lot. Amalgamation of anthropogeny is also made from concrete, uh, dryer tubing, and VHS tapes. And VHS tapes are made from a very thin layer of plastic and uh, magnetic film. Through the inside, it is completely filled with the VHS tapes. And this is a use of another outmoded material. I wanted it to mimic the flowing of oil kind of spilling out and falling onto the floor. So like I said, this is an outmoded material 
And this shows how we continue to pilfer our environment for materials to create items that we use for a short amount of time just to be thrown away when we come out with a newest technology. In amalgamology, I mimic this new type of rock, but I also use plastics that we would find in the oceans. And I put it in a uh, found uh, shipping container because I wanted it to seem as if I found it myself and then shipped it off to be on display or to be studied. What I hope is that being out of these, made out of these materials that people would look at it and wonder what the materials were and what it was made out of. But even more so, I would hope that when they looked at it, they would wonder why is this new type of rock even existing? So through my research and through these last few slides, you can see how I've developed a very strong uh, scavenging and hoarding uh, ability, right? I call this trash mining and, it, and I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. If you haven't done it, I think you should. Uh, collecting and hoarding these obsolete uh, discarded objects that I think should all eventually become my materials has become a very integral part of my making practice. And while collecting these in the last couple of years, uh, I've gotten them from hoarders, scrappers, and local trash collections all over Lubbock. And by doing this, I feel I am transforming these items into artistic, artistic expression. And I've been able to reduce the trash waste in the community, add new value to these items, and illustrate to the viewer maybe one small answer to a disposable society. So in these pictures, you can see just a couple of the places where I have collected some of these items. And I feel like through this unique artist statement, it illustrates how one person like myself in a small geographic area can extend the life of a landfill. They can help clean the local environment and they can contribute locally to the economy. But at the same time, through all this, we share the message of uh, junk amorphous globally. So continuing to uh, experiment with this idea of trash or mixed media as material, I began to renew my abilities in jewelry as well. I wanted to create wearable works with this material. So I wanted to imagine myself as an future archeologist or at the same time an artist. So I call that an archeologist. Eventually we will run out of materials or re natural resources to make from. And I feel like in the future, we may need to make and use that from which we've only thrown away. Okay, messed that up. So through this process, I use found materials in an evidentiary way to defamiliarize and to recontextualize them. Thereby, I am questioning their potential functionality, their values, and our dependency on them. In dissemination of detritus, I am using found objects like this orange PVC pipe as material and jewelry, similar as to the shift in making was in the 1960s. This is where they started to use a lot more found objects and things of that nature instead of precious materials. So this opens up the medium to the outside instead of being a narrow medium that, is, that already has its own formats and styles, okay? So most of the pieces I've made so thus far in jewelry, I have not used any precious materials. It's been mostly found. And through this, I feel like I'm, I, don't, I don't see jewelry as something that is only glamor or decoration or even beauty. It's something that could be used as another way to talk about an idea or ideas. And then also in this process, when I make in jewelry, I, I look at it as if I'm making small sculptures that can be then worn. I then begin to question maybe the relationship between object and body and how this could be used to portray the use of uh, thrown away objects. Now, some may think that 
people may not want to take this as serious as, uh, let's say, traditional precious jewelry. But I think if they took a little time and looked a little deeper, that they'll realize that this is a, a strong statement about our culture and our society. And personally, all materials are equally valued and, and, and valid in an egalitarian way. When you allow yourself to use any material, all materials, then really it opens up endless new possibilities. So visiting the local uh, phone company, uh, I found it to be a, a gold mine of trash. Like the amount of stuff that they throw away on a regular basis was just unreal. I mean, it was staggering to see how much wire was, was just stacked up back there. In Transmission of Ignorance, I created it by taking some of these wires, twisting them together, and then cutting them off at equal lengths. And then with copper and walnut, it created spacers that allowed to kind of uh, space out those wires to create a fanned out wearable. So while we are always in a state of constant flux, we're always evolving and we seem to be creating newer and better equipment to serve us. Once that new tech, the new tech comes out, it just, it, that outmoded object gets thrown away. It's no longer useful. Out of sight, out of mind. I feel like a few people can look past an equipment's usage to its poten potentiality of what else it could be or what else it could do. And I think that's sad. Our culture is eager to throw things out in favor of the new. But what we must be doing is we must change how we communicate about and view the, the value of materiality before we will ever stop throwing things away so eagerly. So in densified absurdity, this was the first time I got to really play with the densified uh, styrofoam. And this is what I created. It was after a long look at the qualities of what this material looks like after it's come out of the machine. And it's been through that densification process. If you look, it has qualities of like bone or petrified wood maybe, uh, rock, maybe even bark. And if you look at the little nod nodule right there in the middle, it looks like uh, pearl. And I think that's beautiful. Now, it also looks very heavy for its size, right? Well, actually it's not. If let's say it was made out of petrified wood, you'd say what, it would probably weigh 10, 15 pounds? It'd be really heavy for like a necklace, but this piece is actually only 2.3 pounds. It's very light for what it looks like. But the most interesting thing to me about this is this contradiction to use plastics as a material to show or to mimic the thing that we are destroying with the very thing we're destroying it with. I think that's really interesting. So in jewelry, I wanted to push this material. I wanted to experiment with it. I wanted to see what I could do. How far could I take it? But at the same time, I was thinking about the value systems that we have in our country and why certain materials are looked at as being worth more than others. And I also continue to use mimicry in this piece. So I called it styrofoam jade. And so with this material, I then cut it, I shaped it, I sanded it, and then I polished it. And as you can see, after it's been polished, it looks like jade. So within this piece, I used silver and styrofoam. This created a juxtaposition between the two mirror materials. One that has been valued for centuries and the other one that is viewed as trash. It's worthless. But once this material is worked or manipulated, it now looks similar to jade, right? So as it's presented now, it's viewed as beautiful. And when it's used, it looks and acts just like jade does. So my question to you is this, is this trash have now have a new value? Just because it is plastic, does that mean it is still worthless? But I think my favorite part about this piece is the look on the viewer's face when they put it on, because that's when they realize how much lighter it is than what it looks like. And it confuses them. And it's, I loved it. It's, it was so much fun. So you can see a common denominator through a lot of these pieces now, the use of mimicry. 
whether that is to show a juxtaposition or maybe a paradigm shift or just to call attention to a wicked problem. So I've always been interested in installation art. Now, before I came here, I didn't really know a whole lot about it, uh, let alone its depth of style or the potential of affecting the viewer. So after researching some artists like Alan Capro or someone contemporary like a I Ai Weiwei, I started to get a better understanding of what this style was and what it was capable of. So I decided to push myself way out of my comfort zone and try this style. Now this piece was also created about the same time as the piece I showed earlier, Usurpation with the tumbleweeds. In Awakened Silence, my intent or my aim was for the viewer to be physically drawn into the space and then become a part of this reality that I've created. With this particular space, you can see it stretches from door to door, making it hard for people to even enter the room, right? And I used hundreds of different types and sizes of rocks, um, as well as handmade rocks that I carved out of wood. Each of the wooden rocks had different textures, and I wanted that to denote different feelings that I had when I made them. Another um, element I have never used before uh, was the, sound, the, the use of sound as material. And I recorded this gorgeous sound that both types of rocks made when they fell to the ground in this closed room. So take a listen. To me, this sounded like an empty cavern, like echoing the sound of emptiness. It was ominous and almost exposed a feeling of anxiety to me. And I felt like it invited the viewer in to come take a look as what's going on in there. The, the, the audience or the viewer was intended to walk in over and navigate through the rocks that I had strewn across the floor. So through this piece, I was exploring again, how the body reacts to material and the relationship to those different materials. And this is similar to dissemination of detritus that I showed earlier, that I'm questioning the relationship between object and body. And in this case, I used natural materials instead of man-made materials. For me, this piece was uh, a manifestation of the anxieties that I deal with on a daily basis. And the viewer is then forced to tiptoe over these rocks, but I felt like only a few of the people after careful examination actually noticed the subtle differences between, well, the, the, the natural rock and the handmade rocks that I had carved. And I feel like this is how many people may feel, especially with anxiety, hiding in plain sight. You would never notice unless you pay closer attention. Bellows in the dark. Through learning about installation art, I, I wanted to start diving deeper into different concepts of installation and maybe like the, the experiences I wanted the viewer to have. And within this piece, I wanted to explore how different materials had different like energies. I wanted to use these materials as a way to express the mood that I wanted the viewer to feel. A form of expressing or communicating specific experiences I've had within my journey in life. So in continuing with the uh, theme of anxiety, this piece was uh, inspired by a poem I had written uh, many, many years ago when I was in a deep state of depression. One of the lines from that poem reads as follows. Such emptiness burdens my soul. It drags me down with the great weight of nothingness, shattering my jagged memories into pieces, like so much glass cast angrily on the floor. The piece pushes scale and was made to be overbearing or to demand space. 
I also made it in sections for maneuverability, but also to allow the viewer to be able to enter into it and to become a part of it. I wanted them to enter into this dreamlike, uh, dreamlike space or uh, feeling of installation. Wow. Yeah, just space. I'm just gonna say that, just space. It is covered with a plastic cloth material and melted with a heat gun, then covered with tar. This gives it a weight or a heaviness, which made each of the uh, individual forms sag with anticipation, which gave them a wariness. This is the very feeling that I have with my anxiety. Inside of each of these sections, you can see these forms that are hung down that kind of droop like stalactites. These were wire cages with uh, rocks that had been wrapped in red cloth and then put into the cage. Before I placed each one into their cages, I spoke in like my negative energy, my negative thoughts, bad memories, all my anxieties into each rock before I placed them inside. So to me, this piece was a, a cathartic process and it was a, a, a way for me to uh, release my anxieties, let's say. And then also in each section, you can see on the floor below these looming dangling forms, um, a bunch of broken glass, both to reference the, the poem, but also this was another way for me to express my, my negative, uh, negative feelings, to, to release those. And let me tell you guys, if you need to release some negative energy, go break some glass, it feels amazing. I feel my favorite part about installation though, is the immediacy of the experience. How the viewer is plunged directly into the experience that I have created. The viewer brings their own knowledge, dreams and experiences to the space. So each person that comes in is gonna be affected by it differently. They become a part of this piece that I've made. There's not one right way to look at it because there's different places to look, there's different places to walk through and you become a part of it. Unlike traditional, let's say a painting where you have one direct view that you look at it. I really enjoy how that involves the viewer. And I feel like this is exactly what I want to do for densified styrofoam. I want to create an installation for my thesis show. And with that, I want to create like an, a dreamlike installation that gives densified styrofoam the agency it deserves. How, you may I ask? Well, I feel like if I take a material and put it through the process of densification and allow it to stay just as it is, and then to show that process, then that gives it the agency that most people have never seen. I want the installation to again have an ominous and weighted feeling. And in doing so, I'm hoping this is um, gonna give the, the viewer a feeling of, of maybe uneasy or regretfulness even for the collective actions of our throwaway society. So something Georgia O'Keeffe said was, whether you succeed or not is irrelevant. There is no such thing. Making your unknown known is what is important. And this is what I feel like I would be doing with this installation. Now you can see in the last couple of pictures that they are of stalactites. And this is similar to the vision I have in mind for my thesis show. I want to mimic, again, uh, stalactites with plastic, which this ties back to the plastic glomerates before. So in doing this, it calls attention to uh, how plastics have effectively inched its way into every crease, crevice, and chasm on the planet. Mm -hmm. Cheesy, I know, but it makes sense, right? So for me, the future is bright. <laughs> I have the machine, I have a material I haven't seen anyone else using in this way. And I plan on continuing on using this material to experiment with. I wanna see what all I can do with it. Something, uh, maybe uh, an idea I have is to create molds. And then as this material comes out, still warm, I can then press it into the molds. And then that, that allow me to make production and make multiples of things and see how that changes what it looks like. 
or what it means even. Another thing I've been thinking about is how could I make a machine that after it's come out of the uh, densification process to make slabs with? So maybe a heated table with a press, like a, a, like a shirt press and see what happens with that. I think that could be very interesting and powerful. So I feel like overall, my favorite part about all of this is that I can continue to involve the community in making these visual statements. And how I do that is for them to be able to um, donate their trash and to see it being reused. That's different than how typical recycling is going now. As I no t talked about earlier, 14% is all that's being collected and only 2% of that is being collected to be reused in a high enough quality. So through that, my process will now show them it being reused right then and there. So I feel like what better way to spread the word about this issue than to involve other people. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we will now uh, open up the format for the audience to ask questions and give comments in the chat. You can unmute yourself to ask or give comments, or you can type them in the, in the chat and I'll read them out loud. Uh, after that, we'll ask the graduate faculty only if they're interested or want